All right. And, what uh, happens if I say no? <laughs> I don't know. You get nuked. You, everybody. This is, <laughs> this is uh, Paul at O0T at the Front Range Six Meter Group. And we now have Scott McIntosh, uh, Deputy Director at NCAR, going to give us a chat on what's going on with the Suns in uh, Cycle 25 and where we're at at this point in time. So with that, uh, without a further ado, I'm going to throw it over to Scott and he can start sharing his screens. Yeah, we'll do that. Thanks, Paul. And I see Frank's on here. Hey, Frank. Good evening. Uh, my partner in crime of late, um, someone that keeps me in line most of the time, if you believe that. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was running a wee bit late. There was a bit of a snafu um, near where my kids practice soccer. So um yeah, not, not a pleasant exercise was conducted by our local uh, constabulary. If you guys, well, some of you are Canadian, you understand that word. So anyway, <laughs> all right, I'll put my screen up and I'm probably, since I'm not really sure who was here the last time, I can't believe it was March. It was six months ago, um, the last time I was here, Paul. Yep. And I... So I'm going to build off largely off of that um, set of slides, and then it's going to be the the kind of update at the end. If that's all right with you, so can everybody great. see my can everybody see my screen? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everybody mute your uh, microphone, please. All right, I'm going to go into play mode. So I should take up your entire screen now, and this is where I have to rely heavily on my memory. Uh, haven't been doing a lot of science of late. So, uh, so anywho, uh, I decided to give this a, a, a appropriate title of After After the Terminator. Uh, some of you have probably veterans of, of the several presentations I've given to this group, and I really thank you all for uh, enduring that. Um, some of you have sent me nice emails, and some of you have sent me really nasty emails telling me never to come back. <laughs> Uh, and just like the Terminator, I'll just say, I'll be back, right? So um, stupid phraseology, but you know, I'll refresh your memory from six months ago. Um, we study these tiny little features on the sun. Well, they're not really tiny. Each one of them is about the size of a continent on our planet, um, but they're cunningly called extreme ultraviolet bright points, or we call them bright points for short. And basically, they're like little mini active regions on the sun. So they have a lot of the same characteristics. Uh, in other words, they're predominantly magnetic objects and they cause a lot of trouble. Actually, they cause almost no trouble. The only thing they cause trouble for are theorists, I guess, uh, when we get through to the end of this presentation. But um, the image on the left is an extreme ultraviolet image of the sun's outer atmosphere, taking about 1.5 million Kelvin. Sounds very hot, but wouldn't burn you, surprisingly, because there's not a lot of atmosphere there. It's like going to Mars. You couldn't have a good party at Mars. There's just no atmosphere. So um, we have a little algorithm that goes in and identifies these small, bright concentrations of emission. And the image on the right shows you those all identified. Okay. We get about probably about 97, 98% of them on the sun's disk. Hi. Uh oh. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. My daughter just decides to come in. All right. All right. So, anyway. My old boss at NASA, you've all heard this story, right? So he's like, I, I, I bet if you track these things for a long period of time, you'll notice something. And I thought at the time he was just teasing me. Uh, and he was because I, he and I wrote a paper on this in 2005. So I, what I basically do is you, you, we canonically look at things that happen at the central meridian of the sun. And if you plot the density of these little objects as a function of latitude and time, you get this plot at the bottom. And now this, this plot dates back to um, 2012, right? I wrote, I made this plot in 2012, probably about this time 10 years ago. Back when I had a full head of hair 
and I only had three kids. Okay, so because uh, number four was on the way, I think at this point. So um, if you look at the plot at the bottom, what we what I kind of noticed in 2012, which I'd completely missed seven years before, was the fact that these uh, features. Um, so if you look at the plot, study it carefully, you notice that there's these green and orange blodges. And those green and orange blodges form a kind of chevron type pattern. And what I noticed was that those chevrons kind of overlap one another. It's like your worst IKEA nightmare, right? That these things overlap one another. And then I noticed another curious thing, that there were patches near the sun's equator where you would get this chevron and then there would be darkness, nothing. And then literally, um, this might be too much information, but I think I was literally in the shower when it dawned on me that when I put the sunspot progression, which is horribly visualized in the middle panel here, that's when the sunspots start to really emerge at, at mid latitudes. So I started to ponder uh, long and hard about this and, and literally went away, gave myself shingles and analyzed about 40 terabytes of data in the next three months, right? So this was probably late in 2011. I was getting ready to go to an eclipse expedition in Australia and my brain just started cranking on this stuff. Here's a few key features, is that these bands strongly overlap in space and time. There was a point in time when the stuff abruptly ends at the equator that's the same time some stuff seems to switch on at mid latitudes. Now, this slide actually was a report I gave to the direct, well, not the director of the NSF, but the director of the NSF subordinate back in the day um, because they were kind of interested in what new stuff we might be finding on the sun. And uh, needless to say that I bored the poor person absolutely. Um, sorry, interruption again. If I fast forward now, um, this took place about the same year. What we, we kind of ra rapidly noticed that we could extrapolate these things out in time, right? Uh, and actually, my five-year-old daughter at the time was the first one to draw the straight lines on these plots because I I went through this. So she took a ruler. And we kind of wildly speculated. So it's a, it was a wag. Actually, it was a swag a scientific wild ass guess, right? That um, the bands that we were seeing at mid latitudes in 2012 would come to an end sometime in late 2019 or early 2020. Fifteen different papers worth of material in it in four pages. So, but anyway, so this sets the premise. We identified things like the, the two hemispheres were independent of one another. They finished at the same time, and you have this overlapping nesting chevron pattern. Okay, try not to bore you, but if you pay attention to these little ovals that are in twenty twenty, um, they will become relevant. Uh, in a little while, okay. Um, the other thing we noticed that was kind of curious was that the hemispheric maxima, so the sunspot number of the sun in each hemisphere peaked roughly or approximately 21.8 years apart. I think we were the first people to note that. I don't know why nobody had seen it before, but it turned out that that's actually a fairly important part of the phenomenology. So that was how things stood in the middle of 2012. Uh, ever since then, we have been aggressively um, tracking this. If that is the next slide, let me see if I can get my control of my device back. You see that? Okay, so in a jump forward to 2017, and with that point, all we wanted to do was verify that 
Well, yeah, what we were saw in 2012 was still tracking. Guess what? It's not doing too bad. This is now five years ago. And what we were really hunting for was those magenta lines. Those magenta lines are where we anticipated Sunspot Cycle 25's bands to start appearing, right? So you've got this uh, massively overlapping interlocking system that's going on. Not a lot of the other ideas have been put together at this point. But now, now comes the, the piece of the puzzle that was entirely obvious in hindsight. We latched onto something um, when we were writing the paper. So it took three and a half years for the first result to get published. Um, it was a little bit like uh, Passchendaele or the Somme, probably. I'm probably not doing a lot of credit to World War I veterans and saying that, but it was maybe the academic equivalent of, of a World War I battle trying to get the first results published. And when we got to about 98% of the way through the work, um, we, we found an old paper, uh, old 1988, where they identified this thing called the extended solar cycle. And um, what they basically found was these extended wings of the sun's butterfly diagram. And for those of you that are more familiar with solar kind of taxidermy, uh, flatly, um, the butterfly diagram is what you get when you plot the latitude and spots as a function of time, and you get this plot that's on the lower right hand corner of my slides here. And if you look at it sideways, it looks like a, a butterfly's wings. Okay, but what they noticed was that the butterfly's wings extend back in time and extend to higher latitudes, and so it's basically the same pattern that we had observed. Um, and it's the, the amazing thing is that that paper was published in Nature in 1988. This was now something like uh, 14, eight, yeah, 24 years later. They had like 70 citations, but everybody knew about the paper. So it's almost like a dirty secret, right? People knew about it, but nobody cited it. The contextual stuff that we added is kind of in this plot and it, and, and it kind of illustrates what we're talking about. So in this case now, a lot of the times I'll be referring to magnetic polarities and they'll be red and blue, um, red for positive polarity, blue for negative polarity. And you can see this kind of progression that's going on on the left-hand side. And what you see is these bands come in, swoop in from high latitudes to low latitudes you see this uh, modulation in the sunspot pattern. When the bands reach the equator and finally die, you get new sunspot growth at mid latitudes, right? So it's kind of like, at this point, we were starting to think that the overlap and interaction of these big magnetic systems was, well, it's clearly affecting the timing of the sunspot cycle but was it also affecting the amplitude of the sunspot cycle, right? Because that's like the, that's like the 64 cent question in astrophysics, right? Is what makes the sunspot cycle and then can you predict it? So this is a graphic that I, I stole from myself um, that uh, Frank and I put in a recent publication that was in the, the Radcom that I don't know if many or any of you have seen this. Um, but I encourage you to go and grab it. If not, Frank and I probably have PDFs that we can uh, distribute to everyone. But it, this is the complex picture in a nutshell, right? And the plot in the bottom, the bottom there are four, no, sorry, there are three different sunspots. So mute your mic, please. Three different sunspot cycles present, cycle 23, 24, 25. And guess what, we'll be hunting for 26. What's present is a situation where, um, and this really irritates a lot of my colleagues, the time at which the sun makes no spots, it's not active, this time we call solar minimum. There are actually four oppositely signed magnetic bands near the sun's equator. 
right? Based on this analysis. And when the two nearest the equator die, it leaves you with two left. Those two are the ones that are responsible for the next cycle. So you can, there's a ongoing relentless battle between um, systems where you only have two bands. So in the ascending phase of the cycles, and then in the declining phases, you have four bands. Eventually, um, those bands nullify one another and you don't, you can't make spots anymore. This is something my, my team's kind of presently looking at is exactly what are the physical conditions that cause that to happen. But it happens again and again and again and again. It's not, um, it's not a fluke. And it's uh, actually very cyclic. The sunspot cycle itself isn't very cyclic for those of you that have looked at it. Right, the, the period of the sunspot cycle varies from eight to 14 years. It's not a rock solid robust oscillator at 11, 11 and a half years. Uh, that's always puzzled people, but everyone just assumes it's 11.6 years. And then you get into interesting conversations with people that study planetary dynamics because that's also the orbital period of Jupiter, but we won't go there, right? So. Keeping going, linking our picture to the hail cycle. And I apologize if I'm going slowly over this. But now this is a kind of trying to show you the progression of these bands of these small magnetic features and the larger underlying magnetic systems. And this is updated to 2020. The emphasis here is on these regions between um, round about uh, 1998 and round about 2011. Remember early on, I told you about an event where near the sun's equator, everything just switches off. This seemed to be the trigger for the things that happened at mid latitudes. Um, and we, you know, for the lack of a better term, it's the end of a hail cycle. And so we called it the terminator event or the terminator for short. Okay. I'm probably going to pay for that for the rest of my life, okay? But the good thing is it keeps coming back. So you can use the glitches all the time. And then if you figure out when all the Terminators occur and look at when James Cameron has made movies, you, you maybe spot a conspiracy theory, right? So anyway. So that was one way of looking at the Terminators is this function of um, latitude versus time at the sun's central meridian, so right down the Greenwich mean time of the sun, okay? The other way to look at it is around the way. And so this is what the sun's kind of activity looks like. And just to mess with you, I flipped the color scale. The, this, this drop in activity on the sun happens within a few solar rotations. This is another thing that blows people's minds, right? So an object the size of the sun can flip its state in the time scale of you know somewhere between 30 and 60 days. That's a mind-boggling change, right? But better than that, when we looked at data that goes around the sun, so for a small window of time, we could we could see all the way around the sun. So for four years from 2010 to 2014. We could see every patch of the sun. And so we did the same analysis. And what we saw actually was that this thing is not just a, happens at one longitude. It actually propagates like a wave. It's almost like a tsunami that propagates around the sun. And in fact, it, it probably has a lot of the similar physics to a tsunami. We won't get into that. But it's a longitudinal phenomenon. So the next challenge for us was to identify when the next one was going to be. Right, so if you go back to that old chart from 2012, we're looking in the 2019, 2020 time frame. Um, we're going to see some signatures that look like this, and maybe some other interesting things. So, just going to recap a wee bit. The sun has a 22-year magnetic hail cycle that looks very much like. Well, we know that they overlap. They overlap spatially. But I think that they interact strongly 
magnetically too. And it's that interaction that helps shape the production of sunspots. I won't get into the stuff in gray, but you can um, figure that out for yourself. One thing to note is that the separation of these terminator events gives you some kind of very crude measure of how the, the hail cycles are overlapping one another. And so, like I said, overlap's important for setting uh, the timing and the amplitude, or at least that's the way it looked. So going back and using some older data, um, this data comes from um, the Royal Observatory in, in Belgium. That's on the top. We do some simple analysis tricks. So we identify the trend, which is the blue line, subtract the trend from the data to get the black dots. The next column down, we've applied a Hilbert transform to extract the, the amplitude and the phase pattern. Now, this seems like a sleight of hand, um, but one of the things that um, I learned when I was working with Frank is that um, sinusoids, uh, uh, and the sinusoids imply a fixed phase. A Fourier transform implies a fixed phase of a signal. And if there's one thing we know about sunspot patterns is that they have neither, right? And so the next step up in complexity from a, from a Fourier transform is a Hilbert transform. And so that now allows the amplitude of the signal to vary in time, but also importantly, the phase, okay? And so when you look at the amplitude and phase patterns of, of this time series that goes back into the 1750s, you see this beautifully elegant thing where our, our little terminator event signifies zero phase crossings of this signal. They're uniquely identified in the data, right? There's no guessing. They jump right out. What is it? It's the maximum rate of change of the number of sunspots on the disk. What does it relate to to our little break points? It's like death, boom. Literally within a couple of rotations, okay? So some of you have seen this before, I apologize. Um, I'm gonna conduct a little experiment with my 24 sunspot cycles and my 24 values of the terminator. And I'm gonna compare two things, okay? I'm, I'm gonna, first I'm gonna compare the, the length scale, um, the separation of the terminators versus the sunspot cycle strength in between them. And then secondly, I'm gonna compare it to the upcoming cycle strength and, and recall our earlier hypothesis that cycle overlap impacts amplitude, but it impacts amplitude of the upcoming cycle. So no surprise in experiment one. Experiment one says there is no predictability at all between the separation of the terminator events and the intermediate cycle amplitude, because that was actually the one before. And so if you compare it to the upcoming cycle strength, you get a plot like this. And this plot is also gonna get me in a lot of trouble. I'll never live this plot down, okay? Actually, I don't care. But, because at the time, we didn't really know how Hilbert transforms uh, played out as a forecasting tool. It turns out it's rather tricky, right? And so what we did was, and this is how Paul grabbed me at first, what we did was we identified, we looked at the pattern and tried to identify when the next zero crossing of the phase function was gonna be. And that was projected out to be May of 2020. May of 2020 against February of 2011, so the terminator separation, would give us a nine and a quarter year um, terminator separation. And by Jingo, a huge sunspot cycle, right? If this relationship holds, then it should produce a huge cycle. And just for reference, my peers, um, got together in a panel that's well documented that you can all read about. It's in, in the literature. Um, Science Magazine wrote a lovely article about it. That Sunspot Cycle 25 would be at, as big or a little smaller than Sunspot Cycle 24, which we all know was a wiener. Um, and, no, and no offense to dogs 
or hot dogs. Um, and that's represented by this magenta dot. So you can see that what we were predicting was basically a, or, or double what my peers predicted, okay? This presents an interesting opportunity, right? Because we don't think that the physics that the sun is manifesting is properly being captured in the models that produce the magenta dot. So if you like, and if I want to use Frank's language here, this presents the opportunity for paradigm shift, right? So in other words, there's very few times in science when you get a chance to directly test a hypothesis, right? So either we are blithering idiots and the new kids on the block are, are really just morons, or the, the colleagues that are using the more established ideas have got locked into some kind of group thing and can't see the woods for the trees, right? Still not clear who's right. But anyway, hold this in, hold this in the back of your head. This is the state of the game, probably, um, and certainly was the last time I talked to you. Um, and in March, we, of course, things had moved on a little bit. So just to recap, we can actually observe the sun's 22 year hail cycle and track it. I get some exciting new stuff. Well, it's not really exciting, but I get some new stuff to show you right at the very end of this that shows that we can, who we really can track it. Um, we've established a, a key feature of the hill cycle, it's death and this termination event. And it seems to be strongly correlated to the next cycle. As a result of that, we think that uh, cycle 25 is going to be a whopper or at least uh, above the historical average. That sounds like a lot of couching. Um, the picture of solar activity that I described to you in, in, in not a lot of time is not what's in the solar physics textbooks. In fact, if you Google uh, solar dynamo, uh, you won't get anything that looks like what I just talked to you about. Okay, so solar dynamo is the process by which the sun's magnetic field is generated and sunspots are produced. It looks nothing like what I just talked to you about. So there's an opportunity in there for someone that writes textbooks too, right? Potentially. And so um, it turns out that these terminators provide a, actually <laughs> other opportunities for doing some fun stuff. And I'll get to that towards the end because the, the measure of the atmospheric conditions that you guys like, the F10.7, um, we can kind of forecast that pretty robustly. So here's the update. There's the old update, there's the new update, okay? So the Terminator that we were anticipating in May of 2020 um, finally arrived probably in the middle of 2021. It's the first time we've directly witnessed the end of a hail cycle. Every other time we've been done it retrospectively. Okay. Since, since December, Sunspot Cycle 25 has been growing rapidly. And in fact, it was going extremely rapidly up to March and then through June. And then it took a wee bit of a break. And now it's starting to ramp back up again. In fact, there's an absolute monster about to cross uh, the solar limb right now. Tomorrow might provide us with some interesting fireworks. So anyway, um, here is a set of observations that I put up uh, today. So, or I put together today, this is the plot again, two versus time of the density of these little tiny features on the sun. And you can quite clearly see that the Terminator passed at the end of 2020. So the big dearth of things at the equator, okay? Other things are odd um, that we hadn't noticed before, but you will see. Look at what happens um, also at the Terminator as a function of latitude. From about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, the number of these little things kind of goes to crap, right? There's a big concentration at mid-latitudes, but at the equator and at high latitudes, it goes to garbage. That's interesting. Something for me to worry about. You probably don't care. 
but it's it's telling you something about how uh, the magnetic environment of the star has changed. Remember that it occurred on an incredibly short time scale. Here it is looking back over the last uh, 26 years. So there's three Terminator events in here, the 98 or 97, 2011, and 2021. So it's clear that it happened, right? We didn't make this up. If I made it up, I've got a large buddy at the center of the solar system that's totally in cahoots with me, right? Um, looking at it in some detail, it's been a little bit complex. Okay, so now I'm going to go into a little bit of complexity here that, um, yeah, right about um, December, the middle of December, the density of these small UV bright points pretty much went to zero at the equator. But if you look closely, you'll notice that there's kind of sporadic islands of stuff at the sun's equator that are just there to give me a nightmares. If I take slices through the progression of the bright point density, you'll get an idea of, of, of what these things look like. Right? So they're, this, this is a, an animation on the right of the distribution of bright points as a function of time as you slice through uh, this thing. So that here, what you want to kind of compare is the, the blue curves with the, the white one at the present. So you see the present that the, bright point density near the sun's equator has dropped to like one. So that one bright point per degree per day. It's not a lot. Factor of five higher at mid-latitudes. This is not a um, subtle change. And you remember I was talking a little bit about longitude. So as we go through, um, and this is, um, basically looking at three different rings in the sun's atmosphere. So there's a, a ring um, centered about 35 degrees in the southern hemisphere, sorry, 25 degrees, a ring centered around the equator in the middle, and a ring centered about uh, the same latitude in the northern hemisphere. And the idea is to see um, basically the birth of, of the next sunspot cycle, right? But also to watch how um, the drop in bright point density propagates at the equator. And Paul, I don't remember, you're cloaked right now. Was our first conversation before or after the election in 2020? Do you remember? I'm not quite sure. But um, there was every bit of evidence that the sun was going through this transition exactly on election night, okay? We were all getting kind of excited, not about the election, but the fact that this was actually happening. And if it had happened then, we were only about four months away off of our original projection, right? Yep. False start. So you can see that there's a drop at the equator and it propagated halfway around the sun and stopped. Right, you can see this red trace in the middle plot that goes that way. As it, that means is it's traveling around this band. It's going pretty quickly. It's going at several hundred thousand kilometers a day, right? It's going quick, right? But it stops for some reason. And so you get like this little burst of activity in November of 2020. And then you get a secondary one in May of 2021. And then finally, in December, you get a real drop. I'm gonna show you what that looks like updated in just a second. But again, this is, you know, what you're looking for here is the fact that the, um, you can see solar minimum conditions on, in the left and the right panels. So there's no activity between um, September of 2016 and uh, roundabout. Uh, January of 2011, there's pretty sporadic un, un, um, sequence spots. And only after the Terminator at the end of December do things start to look organized um, and aggressive. 
the opposite is true at the equator, right? So there's stuff, stuff, nothing. Trying to emphasize this again, you see that bright point density drop that propagates in longitude at some horrifically huge speed. All right, because any straight line in a plot like this, which is space against time, is a velocity, right? So this is moving around the sun at some horrific clip. Here's the current data as of this morning, okay? So I flipped the color scale on you again, apologies. So now this, the idea here was to emphasize more the, the density drop. And you can quite clearly look at the middle and see that the density drop has occurred. But one of the other things you can note here is that um, it's not completely clean, right? The stupid thing's not a theoretical object, right? It's not perfect. And that's actually causing a little bit of trouble. I'll get into in a minute. Um, but the Northern Hemisphere um, is very organized. One thing to look for, for those of you or any of you meteorologists, this is a standard meteorological trick to ident you know, to look at um, wave characteristics and, and clouds uh, and winds. You'll see that there's lines, diagonal lines in this plot. And again, those are indicative of speeds, right? And so actually what they also indicate are that the trains of sunspots basically travel faster than the rotational speed of the surface of the sun. And that you can actually project out in time roughly the longitudes that these things are going to appear at, right? So if you're interested in forecasting solar activity, this is a pretty good way to go about it. But other than that, this superfluous plot is just to show you that the middle in the middle column, yes, the ass fell out of the breakpoint density at the sun's equator, right? If I can even use that phrase. So here's some of your favorite measures now. So this was us observing in, in close to real time, okay? And I've identified a chunk of time and data from uh, 2020, January 2020 to the present day. And I show four different things here, right? So the top panel, if you can see it, is, is what we call the magnesium two index. And what the magnesium two index is used by people that are trying to understand the orbits of low Earth objects, right? It's one of these inputs into atmospheric models, right? It tells you about um, the inflation, how or how inflated the Earth's thermosphere will be, and how much drag a satellite will experience. Same in the next one, although it's it's now looking at the corona. Uh, the third one is the solar radio, the ten point seven centimeter solar radio flux which many of you will probably be familiar with for propagation studies um, measured up in Canada. The fourth one is the X-ray luminosity of the star in a very narrow wavelength range, uh, but it shows uh, some change. And then the last one is the opposite of the others. It's actually a measurement of the cosmic ray flux that base the Earth. So, Round about the universe, there's all kind of cosmic ray sources going off. And our little planet gets bathed by all these relativistic particles. And the sun's magnetic field basically acts like an umbrella to shield the planets in the solar system from all of these cosmic rays. And so as the sun's magnetic field gets stronger, you would expect the cosmic ray flux to drop, right? So. All the other measures go up. In fact, some of them experience like a step-like function. Um, I draw your attention to panel D, the radio flux. So the middle one, the radio flux just goes, boom, just shoots, right? Almost across no time. Remember I tell you this, this happens within one rotation of the star. So within uh, one or two, I guess, between 28 and 56 days, phase change. Having a closer look at the cosmic ray flux doesn't look that spectacular. It's a 6%, uh, sorry, 8% drop over the last nine months. 
but it looks a little bit more profound when I show you on the, the length scale of measurement. In fact, this, this terminator is the largest drop that we've seen. Um, my friends and I are tracking these events too, because they seem to be oddly related to the ENSO cycle. So the El Nino Southern, Ocean, uh, Southern Oscillation. So this big drop in the cosmic rays uh, is something to continue tracking. If you look at the far right hand side of that, you see the again, the butt falling out of the cosmic ray flux. One of the other things we noticed, which caused a little bit of alarm, and I don't think this plot really shows it really well, but um, we started to look at how complex. So like I said, I think earlier, after December 2021, there was a, a fairly solid rapid rise in all of these measures. And then around May, June, it kind of tapered off. And then recently we've started to see it go back up again. And we noticed some curious stuff going on at the sun's equator that um, we're, if you, if you imagine this object rotating in front of you now, right? There would be bald patches where there would be no bright points. And in those bald patches at mid latitudes, there would be sunspots. Then that bald patch would roll away and then we'd have a patch with a little bit of activity. And then the patch with the activity, there's no sunspots. And then it would do it again. And so we'd see this pattern where we would have this very strong correlation between no activity at the equator and sunspots and latitudes, and then hence all the other activity measures that I just showed you, and then the opposite. So th this is probably only remotely interesting to me. But what this kind of identifies is that the, the sun is intrinsically coupled, right? A lot of the models, one of the big things that comes up in this paradigm shift that I discussed earlier, um, it invokes a piece of theory that the sun's magnetic systems aren't strong enough to interact with one another, right? So in other words, they're passive. They're passively driven by the flows inside the sun, inside the sun that look a lot like uh, the cellular patterns in the Earth's atmosphere and the oceans, right? But what this indicates to me is further evidence that the sun, these big magnetic systems inside the sun know all too well about each other and they have almost, almost immediate feedback, right? So there's this big coupled magnetic system. We don't really have a lot of um, situations on the Earth where we can study these kind of things. Uh, but very likely, most stars are doing it. So here's the one that's probably of more interest to you guys. So this is, again, the F10.7, so the 10.7 centimeter radio flux from Canada. And we can look, and you can see the step function in December of 2011. And then you see the ramp that goes up to June. And then it drops a little. But look at the odd, it's like, there's a very clear 28 day pattern in that data. Then ever since the start of September, it's changed. Since the start of September, it's been higher frequency, right? It's cranking up. And, and I'll get to that in a minute. There's something curious happened in that time. Um, those, those of you that pay attention to this stuff, um, it's kind of curious. Um, I won't get into this. We've seen, I showed you this stuff before, but this is what it ties down to, right? So here's February and March. And these plots are provided on a basis by my colleagues in Brussels. And I, I kind of look at these because what they're, they're, what they're basically comparing is it's one rotation of the sun and it's an idea of, so it presents the average value of the sunspot number in blue. And it does this little forecast of what the projected sunspots are going to look like on the next days. And in this plot, you can see modulation, right? So the blue arrows are about 28 days apart. So one rotation. 
okay? And so you see that this, actually since, even though the peaks have been coming down for the last three months, the troughs have been going up. Look at the scale jump. So this is the same plot taken from today. The range is between 100, 0 and 180. Here it's 0 to 120. So you still have this similar 28-day pattern, but now the baseline has jumped up from in the 20s and 30s into the 50s, okay? And that is largely responsible for this. So again, you've got this weird coupling thing going on where there are active longitudes and dead longitudes, but even the dead longitudes are now picking up in their activity. So I'm sure you all want to know if you weren't here in March, what, what our forecast looks like now. So the original forecast is in, in blue. Um, the modified forecast with the 2021 December Terminator is in green. And the magenta dot is still the magenta dot. We're still about a factor of two above. Um, we've dropped down a little bit on the scale because everything moved to the right. Uh, but generally speaking, this, this is why we're saying it's going to be slightly above average. Um, this is all very academic at this point. So it's time to put some uh, tests to the rubber because now we are nine months into the cycle. How's it performing? Oh, see, I told you I'd get out of phase with my own presentations. One of the other things we've been working on is timing. So I hinted earlier, this is a very busy, busy, busy plot. I hinted earlier that um, these Terminator events had also created other um, things that we could look at. They became, uh, we use them for statistical analysis and it turns out that you can see the repetition of certain patterns on the disk, right? So for example, um, forget about the top panel, but if you look at the second panel, that is the sun's polar magnetic field strength. Um, it very strongly, it changes in amplitude, but repeats its pattern. It looks like a fish. Um, and so when the, sun, when the sun's magnetic poles cross zero, that's, hap that's an event that happens right about solar maximum. Okay, peak of activity. My colleagues, who produced the low sun, sunspot amplitude cycle said that solar maximum was going to happen in 2025 because that was basically 11 years after 2014, which was the last one. I think this analysis kind of begs to differ. In fact, the sun is very much on its way to solar maximum already. In fact, we may be, we may be as little as a year out from solar max uh, based on this analysis, but. The reason I'm showing you this is it's another mechanism for us to actually cross validate the data against um, the historical data against uh, the present state. Uh, let me see here, do a quick check -a route. All right, so this was also produced today. So the red curve is our forecast for cycle 25, again, slightly higher than the historical maximum. Uh, the green data, the green are the daily sunspot numbers and the monthly averages. And you'll see that it's nowhere near the blue curve, right? Which it was generously shifted six months to the left. Um, but the red curve seems to be, seems to be um, kind of spot on for now at least tracking in amplitude and time. I'll look at that in a little bit more detail. And if you want to track this online, you can. Um, the, the website is in the lower corner of the plot, heliophorecast.space slash solar cycle. And uh, my buddy Chris tracks this on a daily basis. 
And so this was actually from today. Um, and what we're waiting for is the September average, which will probably be around 95. So right up where these cluster of red points are. Um, so we'll kind of back up closer to the line again. Um, you'll note that it's deviating quite heavily from, from the blue line. Okay. I uh, did this one for Frank. Um, we can also use the same kind of statistical analysis to project out what the 10.7 centimeter radial flux does. And this is the variant that I think we published, Frank, in, in our article. Uh, there's the current data. So it took its little hiatus and now it's climbing back up, but it's still within the statistical average, which is pretty cool, actually. No one's ever tried this before, and I shouldn't have, because, you know, this is how I lose more hair. Anyway, pretty happy with that. Um, nervously watching the data to try and see if the next couple of rotations are going to go absolutely bananas. You'll see that the solar radio flux peaks, you know, averages out up to about a peak of about 180. Um, that will give you pretty nice propagation. Uh, uh, the problem might be that <laughs> we might have a shit ton of flares to go with it, so uh, which won't give you the propagation. So um, to put that in context with older cycles, here's this horrendous plot. Um, it's going to be a wee bit higher than last one, or fairly, that's the, actually the average. It's going to be quite a bit higher, but um, maybe up around cycle 23 levels. Uh, cycle 23 wasn't bad for ham radio. Here's the, the plot that was on, on the NOAA website. It was a subsequent, over the last few months, it's been taken down. It's mysteriously disappeared. Uh, the forecast against, so their cycle 25, peaking in 25 forecast against reality. Yeah, not doing so good. Um, big recap, won't go into in detail, looking at about 180, 190 spots. Um, we're very interested. We're going to go further into this Terminator event. There's actually a couple of very unique spacecraft out there in space right now. One called Parker Solar Probe and the other called Solar Orbiter. And as we get their data back, some of it's still not back um, and not been analyzed yet um, around the event back in uh, 20, uh, 21 back in December, because what we're actually looking for is a almost like a magnetic tsunami that propagates out through the solar system, right? Because that's kind of the only way you can explain the cosmic rays drop in the way they do. So we're looking for that. Um, that would be pretty cool. Um, we've probably still got about somewhere between 12 and 18 months of growth time left in this cycle. Um, so I, we still might reach the peak that we projected, around about 190 spots. Um, sadly, we had to revise, but you know that's the right thing to do, I think. Um, we've learned a lot more about Hilbert transforms in the, the intervening times. And then I'm gonna, we're going to go into a little bit of uh, academic wizardry. Okay. So remember how I said it took about three and a half years to get these, the first paper in this stuff published. Every paper takes about two years. And it's largely because we're probably poking the bear, right? The, the, the rest of my colleagues aren't so quite as enthralled with this as I am. Um, and one of the criticisms that was lobbed at us was that I don't really care that you're tracking these small objects. They are manifestations of things. They are not the magnetic field of the sun. Okay, so we've we've made this leap of faith that we're tracking the hail cycles on the sun. The image on the left is pretty familiar to you now: sunspots, butterfly diagram, what we call the hail cycle bandogram, which we take from our little bright point. We met up with some colleagues that live out in the Bay Area, in Palo Alto, they have a thing called the Wilcox Solar Observatory there. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Kind of cool thing, it uh, belongs to Stanford. 
And they make these very low resolution magnetic maps of the sun every day and have done since the late 70s. And they map the sun's magnetic field too and study it in great detail. And that plot is shown, this is the place where we get the polar field measurements from that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but if you analyze their data very closely, um, you get a pattern like the one on the right hand side. Does it look somewhat familiar? Do you see um, zero crossings in the magnetic field? Right? So again, red and blue, positive and negative. Those white things are where it crosses through zero. Do the crossings through zero kind of rock correspond to those vertical dashed lines? Pretty robustly. So it looks familiar, but that's the saying, you know, we get a criticism, but you're not looking right at the magnetic field, you're just inferring that it's there. Well, sorry, Mr. Theorist. Now we're looking at directly at the magnetic field and it shows the same pattern and the same behavior and the same overlap. And when you compare the two directly, um, you get this. But then that reads, leads to dialogues like the one we just had a few weeks ago. Um, okay, you don't actually see the magnetic field and your bandogram is just pure junk. In fact, that's polite for what we used, but I'm trying to um, up my game a little bit in terms of language, okay? Uh, so I say, okay, how's this? Show them. Do these sign changes correspond? The question I get back, do so the sign changes correspond with your terminators? Because I don't believe that those exist. Because belief is a strong thing in science, right? Belief. Um, look for yourself, was the response. And yeah, they do. We can do it, you know, either quantitatively or qualitatively. Yes, they do. Well, if you're right, because the, the, the smart cookie noticed that the data stopped in 2018. If you're right, then why aren't you showing the most recent Terminator? Did it not show up in the data so you won't show it? Uh, to which our response was hold my beer. Uh, because we needed to go and have all the rest of the data processed and then all the analogous data from space analyzed at the same time. And you get plots like this, which are a little bit cleaner, especially the, the lower ones, which are from space, but you can see those zero crossings very clearly now. And so um, this is from uh, two different spacecraft on the bottom and the upper one, of course, is from the ground. And so, yes, um, we are looking at the sun's hail cycle directly. We are seeing it transition from one into the other. And it seems to be um, messing with um, the sun's ability to make spots. So beyond that, I don't want to speculate any further. What are we watching for? I go back to this plot. Well, we're watching these closely, this one very closely. So the lower panel here, the very lowest panel, I produce this on a daily basis, and we can, we can verify it against the historical average to see um, where we are in phase. So the idea being that, you know, over the coming 12 to 18 months, we're going to be able to say pretty closely when we're, when we're anticipating solar max to happen. So um, again, probably not going to wait till 2025 for that. Um, probably sometime in the next year. So, and with that, Paul, I'll open up to questions. Sorry, I'm not super energetic today. Um, been a rough, been a rough day. So um, happy to answer anything you guys have got. Hey, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Scott. And uh, with that, I'll open up. Uh, just have to unmute yourself there, and you can ask a question if you uh, if you want. I just have one quick one. Um, I noticed the, uh, the the bimodal distribution there, like the the the, the, the camel's hump there, and the uh, forecast for the uh, peak sun uh, solar flux. And yep. at one point, um, somebody was saying that they thought it was going to be a hump, a single, a single hump instead of a double with yep. the uh, synchronization between the northern and southern hemispheres. Is that, uh, is that a possibility or are you still looking at the double hump there? 
it's a bit of a statistical anomaly, Paul, to be honest, the, the double hump. Um, it comes because of the, you're right, because of the activity in the two hemispheres being slightly out of phase with one another. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if this was a single hump cycle, uh, especially that might be the thing that propels it a little bit higher in amplitude um, when the two are slightly better synchronized. I have a plot here. Let me see if I can find it. Hold on, just give me a second. I can do this on the fly. I made this early. Here's one I prepared earlier. See if I can find it if my machine will cooperate. Seems to be indexing itself. Let's see. Oh, this guy. All right. Let me switch off of this and bring this up. Excuse me a sec. Here's a plot that shows that hemispheric asymmetry, right? So where it's red, the northern hemisphere is in charge, where it's blue, the southern hemisphere is in charge. And if you look at cycle 25 and its progression, so from 2021 onwards, actually the two hemispheres are very balanced. So even though there's a massive difference in the longitudinal structure between the northern and southern hemispheres, which if you're paying attention to the sun over the last six months, you'll see, um, they're actually the total number over a month is about the same. So the thing seems to be moving symmetrically. Um, so we'll see if, if, it, if that, pattern continues and that means that the plot that I shared with the 10.7 centimeter flux um, statistically could be off, right? So, and it's probably because of the record only goes back a few decades and it's mostly double peak cycles. So, so it's just, you know, it's one of those live and learn type things, right? But it's a great question. All right, uh, anybody else? Yeah, uh, Steve here. Uh, the Parker Solar Probe, which was strongly put together here in Arizona, uh, what's the status on that? And it wasn't clear, because I blinked, that how much of information from the Parker Solar Probe was embedded in your talk there. I was asleep, I guess. I didn't see that the, there was much going on there. I had a successfully put you to sleep, Steve. Um, <laughs> um, there's none yet because we, we've had two encounters since the Terminator. So it actually is fairly involved. Um, the, the various teams, so the team in Berkeley that looks at the, the composition of the solar wind and the team, uh, the team in Michigan, team in Berkeley and the team where I can't remember, Johns Hopkins that are looking at the magnetic field. We're basically going to compare the encounter before the Terminator, so the one from the this time last year to the two that have happened subsequently. And I think we've already seen that there's been a, a large step up in the dynamic pressure of the of the solar wind and other things. So it's just we haven't really published it yet. Um, one thing we're going to look at is the uh, the encounter that happened around the equate the Terminator event because we should actually maybe see this front front propagating out through the solar system. So that's that would be very cool if it existed. Um, you'd probably hear us screaming from the rooftops if that actually exists in the data. So okay, okay. Right, and then we'll have to cut this part out of the um, of the presentation for um, science embargo. Right. So, Scott, what, what, when when will you think you when do you think you'll know if it's going to be a single peak or a double peak? Um, I I think given given that we're probably only about a year away, it'll show itself pretty soon. I I I'm curious. I, I'm not joking. If you watch, um, if you you know, find a web browser where you can, and if you want, I can provide some details. Um, you'll notice that what we call the wave number pattern. So this longitudinal pattern in the Northern and summer, Southern hemispheres are very different 
but the total number of spots is about the same when you go around the ring. So when you take one rotation into consideration, it's kind of surprising. So over the next couple of months, there's some evidence that the, the North has actually started um, being more than one active longitude. The South is about five. So it's, 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 it could well be that the North starts to take over soon. So then we'll, we'll, we'll just keep watching it. So um, the thing that we're watching for, so the things we're watching for next are the, how the, uh, the polar coronal holes close. So that, that diagram that I showed you that I didn't describe at all about how to forecast what's coming up involves the closure of the sun's polar coronal holes. So if you know what those are and what to look for, those slowly shrink with time, and when they disappear, that's solar maximum, right? So you're, we're, we're about a year away from that. Um, and how they are phased in time, they're pretty much together. So I, that's why I'm, I'm pretty confident it's going to be a single peak cycle. But again, I could be wrong. Uh, Scott? Would a shortened uh, cycle 25 indicate a, a yet a stronger cycle 26? Wow. Read those tea leaves, Chris. <laughs> right? So, well, actually, what matters is when that Terminator happens, right? Yeah, assuming the peak comes earlier, then the Terminator comes earlier, then 26 Possibly. is big? Possibly. Um until we see 26. So when solar max happens, we'll start to see 26, right? Because that's the other thing. If you look at the pattern, the high latitude band starts to show itself. It, that's when the 55 degree uh, magic starts to happen, which we really don't understand, right? We, we have no idea why. But these new cycles start at about 55 degrees solar latitude. and um, when we start to see 26, we'll have a good bearing on when that Terminator is going to happen. We have, we have a plot with the equivalent of the old magenta lines on it, believe it or not. Right? So we're, 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 we, can, we can bootstrap our way to that. And it's looking like 2031. So that would be slightly, slightly bigger than average. So that would be about 10 years, but the it's a trap shoot. The sooner the better for most of us here, I think. Scott. I get Peter. that. Yeah. Hi, Peter. Thanks Hi, for your email. You? Good. I'm good. Uh, Scott, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, most of the data I take that you presented is from the photosphere and some aspects from the corona. I'm wondering yep. how deep is the manifestation of the hail cycle and the solar cycle into the sun? That you're then seeing at the corona at the say photosphere, dude. That's a great question. Remember how I said that it's when we look at those longitudinal plots, the 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 features that we're tracking propagate faster than the surface of the sun. Yeah, that tells you that they're deep. Yeah, but right. How, so they're rotate. Any idea, model wise or no. otherwise, how deep this is? I mean, the sun's pretty big diameter. <laughs> Yeah, so the outer 30% of, of the sun is like a convecting fluid, right? Yeah. We think that where these objects are is, is like at the bottom of that. Okay. <laughs> but we're not sure, right? I mean, you know, one of the things, there's, there's some heavy duty nuance going on that a lot of my colleagues believe in it well, they use a tool called helioseismology to probe the inside of the sun. It's basically like seismology, but you measure the acoustic variations at the surface and you use seismological techniques to infer physical structure through the sun, right? Mm -hmm. That's, our, that's a basically our only way to look below the photosphere. But, but in order to use that theory, you have to make some pretty wild not wild, but testable, yeah. testable assumptions, right? And I'm not sure that those assumptions hold. So it, it, what it really boils down to, Peter, is are the magnetic fields that we're seeing, 
that are down at the bottom of this ocean very strong. If they're very strong, then that theory can't hold. Uh, and if they're very the, if they're very strong, it would help to explain things like the Terminator and all these other things, right? Because if the if the textbook theory of how sunspots form and the dynamo and all this stuff is real, then those magnetic fields aren't strong enough to interact with one another. And they basically just get pulled around by the circulation, right? Mm -hmm. But actually the circulation is going the opposite direction from the way the bands move. So there's, there's all kinds of conundrums and counter, counterintuitive things that seem to be going on if, if you believe um, the smoke that I just blew up your butt for 45 minutes, right? Well, I have, I have one other question that might relate to uh, what you were just saying. Uh, and and uh, you, the, one of the last pictures you showed was uh, the series of uh, peaks of the solar cycle. And you mm -hmm. indicated the, when the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere were dominating. I noted at the time of yep. the first major peak in the late 50s, into the, uh, at the time of the IGY, I guess, um, that it dominated, the, the, the northern hemisphere dominated for a significant amount of time compared to all the other cycles. Is there any uh, yeah. any science in behind that that you can speak to? Yeah, well, you want me to throw that back up again? Sure, if it's useful to all. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that that it's pretty wild. Yes. Right. That's and we've a, got that's we, a, we've got a fair amount at, at the last cycle, but not nearly as much at nineteen, and maybe there'll be a lot more. And I'm just surmising than the twenty fifth cycle. More like eight and, nineteen. So the one thing we haven't explored yet, Peter, to be honest with you, because we've never had time, is that this the process that I'm describing that happens over the the whole sun has its own like little uh, epicycle that happens within a hemisphere too, right? And we haven't really explored that because we're too busy trying to understand what's going on globally. Right. Um, and, and very likely the key to all these questions, like Paul's double bump question and all that stuff, is now about understanding the phases of the epicycles between and independently in the hemispheres. So they're they're definitely coupled to one another. Uh, but um, how you can get a, a situation where the northern hemisphere just dominates for 17 years, I don't know. You know, there's there's other things in there that um, aren't immediately obvious. So if you look at the uh, longer time series, um, you can see that the the sloshing between the northern and southern hemisphere changes every 88 years or so. Right. So the the north will dominate for a long period of time, and then the south dominates, and then it it's kind of like it sloshes back and forth. Right? There's a thing called the Gleisberg cycle that you may have heard of mm -hmm. that's probably tied to that. And, and if you think about um, the terminators and things like that, the hill cycle here, um, we can actually, based on the analysis going back to 1750, if you plot the terminators, you can see the Gleisberg cycle, right? So that if you plot the time separation between the terminators, you can actually see that it sloshes around. So it's never always zero. It's oscillating around 11 years, right? Well, it's what about really, the monitor it's minimum wild. or the score minimum? I mean, they had a different pattern. Does that yeah. fall in here somewhere? It's part of it. Right, so we don't, we really don't know why it gets so out of whack like that, right? There, there's, maybe I can, if I've got a second, I can pop something up here that, um, from the presentation that I can show you. Um, let me see this. So you're, you're, you're provoking some heavy duty solar physics now, right? So. Let me see, I'll go back to my presentation. 
and jump way back up to the Hilbert transform stuff. <laughs> and it might not be super clear here. I'm trying to look. Yeah, I need to find a, I, I need to go find a different plot, but um, there's some indicators, right? So one of the things I think I, I talked about last time I was on, or maybe the time before that, was that, that when amplitude comes way down, you see that the terminators get really separated, right? And when amplitude goes up, they, com they compress. There's, a, there's another feature that it's harder to see in here, I, and it, but for the fact that I would have to hunt for it, and maybe I can send you an email. Okay. But there's something else that happens. Um, that when there's very intense flaring happens, the phase pattern changes angle. So you see how these are all beautiful lines? The, the, the bottom panel lists are all pretty straight lines. You see that the red, the red line and the black dots don't always line up. And so there's actually pitch changes in that angle, right? And, and right, uh, like in 2003, when we had the massive Halloween storms, there was a huge deviation in that line. Huge, right? You can't mistake it. And we, we are kind of exploring the hypothesis that that's what slowed down cycle 23 and made it eat into cycle 24, which brought cycle 24 down, right? Mm -hmm. So it basically extended the terminator time because if you think about it, if you destroy a lot of magnetic field in some huge flares, if this thing is just a big magnetic attractor and you destroy a lot of field, you're going to slow down the machine, right? Because if it's all about mutual attraction, it's all about the strength of the field. And, and we, but then other runaway cases of that where the thing's just flaring so much, they destroy so much that it slows things down and you get into grand minima like conditions, right? And then what does it take to get back out? <laughs> right? I, I don't know. These are, I, um, one of the things that we've been looking for round about the Dalton minimum, so around about the 1800s, <clears throat> and even going back to the, the, the Eddy minimum, right? Going back, you know, uh, the modern minimum, sorry. Yeah. Eddie, we're, Eddie. We've been looking for records of very intense rural activity in like France, Germany, Portugal, and Spain. Why? Right, we're, we're looking for a smoking gun that would say that the sun was super duper active in the early 1600s, right? And that super activity ended up destroying so much flux that it basically caused the mono minimum, <clears throat> right? It basically slowed the whole damn thing down. And when it does that, it can take numbers of cycles to come back out of it again, right? So I don't know, it's highly speculative, but we've seen a lot of examples um but then again there's no model you can test it is so this it's purely a dynamo is this likely a dynamo effect as primary function the first yep. forcing function yep but, well, but the much. problem here, but this is the, the interesting thing here peter is that's the tail wagging the dog right yeah, so you mean there's something behind it yes <laughs> Right, so now you've got flares that can, you get small scale things, so they're huge, right? But small scale things that can affect the global picture, right? It's like um, Hurricane Ian, apologies, hope, hope no one's in Florida. Uh, Hurricane Ian affected our weather for 30 years, right? That's kind of what we're talking about. Gotcha. Well, thanks so, very much, Scott. Great. Good to chat again. Yeah, you too, man. Take care of yourself. Yes, if you could send me that a paper or at least some data or something on that on what we were just talking about there. Yeah, we actually put an Easter egg in a paper about this 2003 thing. Great. And it, it somehow managed to evade the peer reviewer's eyes. <laughs> yeah, there are questions, guys. Sorry? 
Well, I just want to see if any if there's any other uh, questions to get you know while you're still uh, awake. <laughs> I do. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Scott. Um, I'm curious. Are you aware of the uh, work of Miles Mathis <laughs> regarding the cycles? You know, people point me to it, but I'm not um, not very familiar. No. Well, he's uh, in, in, in not just considering Jupiter, but all the planets. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, that the the barometric center, right? That the, that the hell cycle is the relationship between Jupiter and Saturn. And that yeah. you know, the, all the planets are interacting with the sun and the galactic core. So it's right. a you know, lots of players on a dance floor. Yeah, you know, it, the, the, the problem I have with that is that the tidal forcing is small, right? The energy density and tidal forcing from planets is actually pretty small, even the gas giants. And, and we're dealing with a magnetic phenomena here. And I'm not really sure how unless there's something very subtle happening with the pool of the core or the density of helium inside the sun, how the tidal forcing can affect um, magnetic fields. Well, he's also using his theory of uh, photon uh, recycling uh, through all bodies in the solar system, which is not, it's not a dynamo. You know, yeah, he actually has papers uh, expanding uh, anti photons and photons going through the core and leaving at the equator. Well, I see that I see that Frank uncloaked himself. Does that mean we're in for some uh, some teaching? It just it just sounds very I, you know it's I commented on it earlier, right? That the average sunspot cycle is about 11.6 years in length. The orbital period of Jupiter is about 11.68 years. Yes. I thought, when I heard that, I thought it was beautifully elegant, and then I looked at the numbers, and the numbers just don't add up. Right? The, 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 the gravitational numbers are small. Well, it's not the gravity, it's the photons. Yeah, but I don't know. Photon fluxes. <laughs> this is a massive momentum object, right? So I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying that Miles is wrong. I'm, I guess I'm not saying I'm right either then. But because he's I think we, um, pretty, uh, it, the, the aren't many minimums ahead. He's predicting a pretty strong one in 2035. Okay. What about the, what about the upcoming one? The one that we're on our way to? Something about, not... something about double peaks, that there are many more, he, he kind of questions your terminators as oh. to what the you physical- You think they don't exist? If they're, if they're physical. If they're physical. You saw them for your own eyes? Well, that's, well, that's, uh, is the, that's the problem with statistics. Are they real or is that something that you, know, you want to see? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that they're real. So, but again, you know, I'm the guy that found them. So maybe I should go do some research. Can you point me to some websites? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Hey, any other questions? I'm sure there's lots of, I mean, there's a lot of stuff here. Uh, uh, Scott. Uh, I I had a question about why well, I had a few questions. Uh, Go ahead. And, and I would admit that I didn't fully understand everything, but I I'm young enough and new enough. That makes that makes I, two of us. I I'm I'm okay to admit that. Uh, but I, I did. What is I saw there was an asymmetry between um, the uh, sunspot cycle peaks and the terminators and it seemed to be skewed towards the uh, left uh, but 
then I got more distracted by you were looking for Aurora events in the past in the 1600s. Uh, <laughs> is there, could those be recorded in ice cores or other things that have some magnetic, you, you could, there's some magnetic susceptibility that could be recorded in ice cores. Uh, but the fact that you were looking for them implies that there, there actually may be a way to do that. Yeah, so yeah, there's two ways to look at it, right? So yeah, no, a great question. Um, one is through the ice core records because you record precipitation of um, radionuclides in the ice, right? Yeah. And, and the, the highest um, ground level events and actually fairly moderate geomagnetic storms produce that. Uh, big whoppers are easy to see. The problem is that ex actually extracting that information from the ice cores is non-trivial, right? So, and honestly, and, and to do that expedition, I believe there's a couple of bad sci-fi movies about that. <laughs> um, that have ended up unleashing monsters on the globe, right? Uh, when you go and take those ice core samples out, uh, no, kidding, but kidding, but not, right? Um, one of my friends did a project like that, and I think the project cost about six or seven million dollars. And and so what we're really looking for first is um, anecdotal evidence that would permit us to go and get more ice cores, right? <laughs> right. So what we're looking for is that evidence, um, and like I said, in that you know you've got to think in the 1600s where you would have reporters. Right. And if you think about latitudes below Oslo, right, because up in Tromso, they would have a lot, or, or uh, Wellington in South Africa and New Zealand, you would have a lot of observers. But what you're looking for are Rory that penetrate further lower in latitude, right? Because then you get bigger storms. Right, so the solar wind generates a lot of aurora, but they're they're stuck at high latitudes. But but aren't but, there already? I mean, people have been collecting ice cores for a long time. I, yeah, but I mean, you have to you have to pass I mean, it through a specific process. Okay. Right. But, so so the ice cores may exist. I mean, I I know they have them in big expensive freezers that cost more than my life, uh, but. Uh, I mean, so do, do they really need to get new cores or, or can these just be examined? Well, you've got to melt them, right? So, um, oh. right. So my buddies from New Hampshire basically got all the hardware that they need to analyze the cores, right? And so the idea is here is if we find enough anecdotal evidence, can we get another expedition to go get more? to do a targeted search. And the problem is, right, because of the glaciation and the, the time history is not super linear, right? And so, you know, you, there's a, like an annual clock that goes through, but the, and it may well be, honestly, Dave, that um, if we go back and look at the data in New Hampshire that they've got from the last extraction they did, yeah. we haven't actually looked at it statistically using the Terminator evidence right so a lot of the things that we've found and this is a whole different talk um there's like a throwaway bullet point where i said that we use these terminators as statistical for defining basically a clock right yeah. and if we use that clock to analyze that the existing ice core samples maybe we'll be able to pull out something interesting right there's, okay, a, there's well, now a series of papers that have gone off to look at this solar clock idea. And, and that makes so. sense. And, and, and to go back, I was skipping my middle question. Uh, it sounds like your estimates differ from the uh, other people because you're looking at the magnetic cycle or system or ecosystem on the sun in a different way. Uh, yeah. And, and, and maybe that's, is that a correct way of? Yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know. Frank, you've been very quiet. Would you say that's right? I'm just looking at it differently. Uh, yeah, because you have a theory. And the thing that I think ham radio operators don't realize, and I think our, our Redcom paper tried to establish that, we don't know what NASA NOAA ISIS did. They don't tell us. It, even ham radio operators say good science is subject to peer review, Eric Nichols, for example. So, yeah, you're looking at it differently, but you're looking at it differently and publicly and publishing things in peer review. Roughly, because we academics count things, roughly how many papers has your name been on with regard to this, this focal area? Two dozen now? I mean, I'm just throwing out stuff I've read. Like how many papers have you published on this whole theoretical genre? Uh, not enough. Well, yeah, but, but here, here's <laughs> what I'm saying. As somebody who studied paradigm change in science, I'm going to guess you published two dozen after fighting the dragon and reviewer number two. Yeah, <laughs> to, to, to get to, to to get the first few in there. Yeah. So so what happens is there's kind of a theoretical vertigo in a discipline when this happens. Uh, our friends and loved ones down in Florida are suffering with with the current hurricane and stuff is going around and around. Well, in theoretical terms, that's happening right now because Scott and his team, Bob Lehman and just a host of others have continued to chip away with articulating a theoretical paradigm. It's not perfect. Some of it's conjectures. I mean, look, if Art Bell was still alive, he would have you on and say, uh, east of the Rockies, we have Dr. Scott McIntosh with convective tubes in the sun. Ooh, who, who could imagine such a thing? And no, no one stuck their head in the sun to see them. Yeah, there are conjectures that link parts of a theory together. You stitch those together and you have to do that. No science is without assumptions. What, it, what excites me, and I, I've certainly said this to Scott, is that we're getting an opportunity to see an actual paradigm change in the making. And in our little modest papers we published in Radcom, I've likened it to the Einstein-Newton clash. Maybe the science isn't at that level of scientific status. Maybe, maybe not. Sun's pretty important though, right? Well, um, I, but I, but I, it's I really important that. to see what, what Scott's team's done and it won't be undone. Now I'll close with that. Well, I, I, I am an academic, so I, I understand paradigm shifts. Yeah. Uh, but I'm not a sociologist, but, or maybe I should become a scientific historian if I'm seeing a real paradigm shift here. Uh, I, well, well, I, well, I, I certainly think you are. And I, I believe it. Yeah. And, and so that, that's what is. To some degree, it's elegant, exciting, and yet confusing. That's why I use the term <laughs> theoretical vertigo. I mean, Scott, does that, does that ring a bell? I mean, the notion of vertigo, you know, when we get dizzy and we think, you know, we're losing our balance. There's uh, a think, comfort. There's a warm, fuzzy comfort to an old paradigm. That it may be wrong. It may not do much for us. Uh, but anyway, so I... I'm I'm certainly a, a fanboy, as I told someone in another talk. I don't play for Manchester United. I'm just a cheerleader that tells you when they make a good play. And Scott's team's making not only a good play, but a great play because he has theory and he's following the data. Just the fact that they adjusted when they knew the Terminator had occurred in December, then revised their forecast, it didn't make their stuff look better. It kind of made it look not quite as good, right? But that's honesty and integrity in science. And at best, we got out of the NASA NOAA panel, oh, we have a new revised graph. Don't pay any attention to the scientists behind the curtain. Many of you may not know that those scientists were behind the curtain one floor down from Scott's office at NCAR when they were making those decisions. <laughs> anyway, I, I'll, I'll ring off with that, Scott. Thank you. Yeah, and I was lurking in the background. Yeah. So. Thanks, Frank. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah.
Any, any but, other? Uh, David, those, those are all great points, Dave. And, and Peter, I will follow up with you about that because it's just been a curiosity up to this point, okay? Sure. Because yeah, I look forward to it, Scott. Yeah, we can probably pinpoint exactly when we would want to look. So the, the study shouldn't be that hard. And, and if we don't see anything, it's back to the old drawing board, right? Right. You've got to come up with other mechanisms to make it slow down. Or actually just proposing some measurements that need to be done. Because the ice well, cores are available. Yeah, we have to see what processes and experiments, measurements. We have to see what processes have been run through and how it would differ from the the program the project that my buddies in New Hampshire did. So because they were specifically looking for certain radionuclides. So mm -hmm. well, and, and the people with the ice cores generally don't like to have them melted, but I, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, there may, I mean, because they're looking for a magnetic susceptibility or whatnot, but th there may be ways to shave off or drill small uh, cores perpendicular to uh, the core. Well, at least as long as you're not releasing the crack and, you know, it's all good, right? Well. <laughs> no, but it, 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 you know what? If anything comes up with this from this, I will reach out to you, okay? Ice cores are sort of like moon rocks. They they can slice up little bits and fire them off the labs. And this is uh, this is well and truly worth my while tonight. Thanks, Paul. Well, I, I mean, the the real trick is making an argument to NSF or the the people in possession of the cores, and that there is a reasonable chance of success, and it's worth. Uh, sampling the core which is destructive and obviously if you're sampling anything like a moon well, rock or whatnot it's destructive but if you can make a case that you have a reasonable and reasoned expectation that there is a it's worth looking at i, I mean that's what well, that's the case you have to make i'll tell you and you may have that if if that this mechanism is responsible for slowing the machine down. Uh, the, we won't have to worry about reviewer number two. It'll be reviewers three, four, five, six, seven, and to infinity we'll have to worry about. Because we'll go a lot further than just rewriting the textbooks with that, because it's that's a, anathema. Right, it's kind of, it's just, yeah. But but I can only think of a couple of ways of slowing the machine down. And and we have some contemporary evidence that uh, the machine did slow down. And, you know, that's why, that's the primary reason why cycle 24 is weak. And if you remember back on those crazy charts I have, cycle 24 was exactly on the line. Not just, hovering around it was bang on and if you go back to 19 when was that when would that have been 2003 when they were trying to forecast cycle 24 they were all off in time and amplitude all of them right that's that's the the you know the so the equivalent of the panel that met in 2019 met in 99 i guess and they were wrong just as wrong as the ones in 1988 that met. Scott, so, yeah. let, let, me, let me dovetail on that with, with this point. The, the website that Chris has, your friend, um, is, is pretty unique. And as I say, when you watch this every month where the average gets played out, and, and as you know, I tweeted out last month when it was released, and I said it's right on to the bone. I mean, it was exactly a point estimate of, of what your prediction was. Look, you and your team are going to continue to, to, to plug away, chip away. The more recent uh, thing that I read that Bob Lehman was the first author on, on the solar clock, when you begin to organize things like flares, a terminator, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pre-terminator, pre all that. But so if once you get the metaphors, and here's where I'm, I'm and David, you know, tell me you've been a sociologist and a statistician, the metaphors matter. 
Because once you have a metaphor for, wait a minute, we're not looking at a sine wave anymore because that's an outcome of a process that the Macintosh group are trying to help explain. So let's don't look at the sine wave. Let's look at this clock. Now, when you play that out another five years and you've had three panels that, that have been wrong, and as Chairman Bisecker said, um, we've been doing this for 100 years and, you know, we don't have a model that works. And then, then he said, but when a group makes a decision, somehow that's superior. I think Mr. Spock would say that's not logical, but hey, we'll, we'll let that go. Now, what's going to happen in five years when the Macintosh model, assuming it continues to stay on track? And as a statistician, I don't think the actual sunspots can change and reverse themselves to go back where Noah would like for them to go. I just don't believe that will happen. I can be wrong, but I just don't believe it after looking at this. So you're going to be successful. I've told them before you came on about, I, I got you to, to say you're going to do a jig in your, your Scottish kilts uh, uh, it, when you're successful. But imagine yeah, wants it, to see that. As, as, as David, as David it said, imagine how NSF, and other big science agencies are going to respond when then they get your request for funding. I mean, how can they say no after the paradigm that isn't, that is they don't tell you how they're doing the official forecast, but you do, your team does, and you're more correct. So how, how then can they not say yes to funding this new paradigm that's emerging pretty hard for as somebody who's been on some of those panels and who's been a panel manager for another federal agency and advise some of them of how are you are you ignoring fundamentally new work because the the old guard who's on those panels you know wants to suppress the, the new ideas the less established ideas how can they say no to what you want to, and your team want to do, say, five years from now if you're successful? Yeah, the one, other than the wonders of peer review. Regardless. Well, but, but yeah, but, but you know, when you've got panels reviewing proposals, it, it's the same, but yet it's a little bit different. You've got a panel manager who, who tries to keep them from whispering to one another and saying, we've got to keep this Macintosh guy out of the oh. trough. It's less money for us. I mean, that, I, I was one, so I, I know that's their job. So, so I think in five years and picking up on what David is saying, some of the others about these core samples and things, those are important things, data sources. You're already mining a lots of important data sources and, and doing things that back in the day, Wilson in 88 could not have done. Imagine back in 88, Wilson having 10 terabytes of data. For one thing, wherever he was located, who the hell had that much storage that one scientist could use? It's a the whole university, then, right? I mean, the whole university. <laughs> I doubt it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I just I don't see how it can can turn back on itself. And I think a lot of the good ideas you're getting tonight from from this group, this group is is more astute than maybe some amateur radio groups might be. <laughs> Yeah, Frank, Frank, I think this is my third time on, and, and I hope, you know, maybe there'll be a, a fourth time, and, you know, Paul and his crew have been very patient listening to uh, to my guff for a couple of years now, right, Paul? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so, I first heard you on, on, a, on one of those ARRL or, uh, radio programs on the, on the internet. That's when I found, hey, this guy's right next door. <laughs> yeah, so I appreciate I appreciate all your time, and and this really has been very valuable tonight. And and Peter, I will connect with you, and I'm going to go look for some papers because actually, the, you know that the 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 most hilarious way when I talk to Bob Lehman about this stuff, right? So usually when I'm driving to work in the morning, he gets a phone call because it's eight my time, 10 his time. And um, we talk about this kind of stuff and we always go end up going, every phone call ends up with going down a rabbit hole. But you know, usually what we see is um, our first method of attack is to load things into PowerPoint or Kino, right? And then, then it's a case of drawing a couple of lines on a plot. 
and you go, is this worth looking at any further? Then it, then the terabyte chase starts, right? Where can we get data from? I, uh, I've got I've got feelers out there for some pretty interesting precipitation stuff right now, but I'm going to go look for some ice core papers and talk to my buddies in New Hampshire. I hadn't really joined those dots yet. So that's, that's inspiration from tonight. So Scott, one, one little final thing was, was Wilson, was his background oceanography? Am I, am I making that up? No, he's an oceanographer, Frank. Now, now here's why I asked. Imagine he presaged some of your ideas about the sun sloshing around. What, what do oceanographers do? I, I once negotiated a transfer of a group from the Navy called NAVO. They were some of the best bathymetrists modeling the world's oceans from them to Mississippi State. That if I was strong enough as an administrator to get people from the Navy to move from one side of a hallway to the other. Now that's being a really, really good administrator. I want you to know that. So I learned some stuff about uh, oceanographers and bathymetry by, by doing that. There was a political deal for that, by the way. If they stayed with the Navy, they would have to release some of their results the Department of Defense didn't want them to. If they became part of Mississippi State, they didn't have to release it. So that, that's the the backstory. So it hurt. It it hit me when you cited Wilson stuff, and I went back and read about him. Uh, oceanographers and bathymetrists particularly talk about these underground vectors of prevailing flows under the ocean. The Department of Defense likes to know that why hunt for red October. That's why. So isn't it interesting that someone who had a background in oceanography from those paradigms presaged some stuff that you and Bob and others were working on years later mm -hmm. about the sun? I was, I was honestly amazed when I started looking at that work, Frank, uh, you know, forensically, I was, I was shocked because we reached the same conclusions as them completely independently i was kind of blown away and uh then i i went around and i you know this i've interviewed the remaining members of that team we lost peter wilson in 2005 i think but um i've i've either worked with or interviewed the others yeah and and it's kind of they have some interesting tales to tell about the the late mid to late 80s and how that work yeah. was received and yeah, it's, it's none of it's good. Yeah. So, but anyway, that's a, should do a sociology talk on that one, one day. That's great, Scott. And thanks Frank. And it looks like we got a lot of sun today. <laughs> yeah. We... You know, and thanks Paul and thanks everyone else that those that have hung around to, to chat. Yeah. And, um, so I, I, I didn't want to keep you this late because I, I know you've got children and you got other things to do and you got to get up in the morning, go to work, but um, uh, definitely appreciate you spending the time here. Uh, we're going to have, an, a, I'm going to leave the, the bridge open a little bit if somebody wants to, if folks want to chat a little bit longer about other stuff, but uh, I'll, uh, I'll stop the recording now and so we can uh, uh, save it for uh, publication uh, uh, on YouTube tomorrow. So uh, I'm just going to turn off the recording and uh, we'll go to the general discussion.